Hello, I'm Harold Wilderson. I'm really happy to be here. I have some things to share with us. I say us because I'm listening to, to what the Lord's given me to say, and it's good stuff, and I really need it. I hope you do too. And God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. Whatever it is that you need, God is there to help you. And he wants to save you. And if you're not saved, get saved. Get, do it now because we don't have the promise of another minute. And the Lord could come in the next 10 seconds. It might be 10 minutes. It might be 10 weeks, 10 years. Who knows? But he promised to come and receive us unto himself. And if you're not ready, get ready now. Just say, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I've sinned and I've, I'm, I need forgiveness. And I know you can do all that for me. And I want to live for you, Lord Jesus. I want you to be my Savior, my Lord, and my Master. I want you to be my comforter. I want you to be my encourager. I want you to be my healer, my protector. I, I need all those things, Lord. And I know it comes from you. That's what I want in my heart. And I thank you for receiving me as one of your kids. Uh, today, we want to talk about um, the title of what I have to say. What I'm going to say what we have to say because it's not me. Uh, all of him, none of me. Uh, Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. I'm a farmer at heart. I do other things too, but uh, as a farmer, uh, I know what a vine is. And I know what all the little branches are on the vines. I cut a lot of little branches off because I don't want them there. Uh, on a tree, for instance, I'll cut all those lower branches off, first of all, because I don't like them smacking me in the face when I'm mowing around them. And the second reason is I want a nice straight trunk because in my lifetime, I have some trees that grow pretty fast. One of them, one species is a locust tree, and I love locusts. It's good for firewood. It's good for timbers. When you're building, may they make really nice six by six posts when you're building a pole barn. Uh, I just I just like to grow some of my own lumber. And uh, I just, uh, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, and there's more to all that, but he goes on to say, uh, if you abide in me, and I abide in you, then you will bear much fruit. And so when I'm praying it back to him, I say, Lord, I'm grateful that you're the vine, I'm a branch, and as I abide in you and you abide in me, we bear much fruit. And so we have some things to say here today. We bear much fruit, and without him, we can do nothing. <clears throat> without him, I can do nothing. Uh, but we, we are here today, us and Jesus. How's that? Um, I'd like to read from Second Corinthians chapter 5. I wanted to read the whole chapter. I think what I'm going to do is go to, uh, there are 21 verses. I was going to read them all, but I'm going to start with 17. And verse 17 uh, is what we really want to get into ourselves today. But it's Second Corinthians chapter 5. Write it down. Remember, I said you ought to have uh, a pen and paper when I'm talking because I don't uh, get to read every scripture. Usually I do, but if I give you a scripture, you ought to write it down, and when we're done here, you can go ahead and look it up and see for yourself what the Bible says. We need to get into the Word. Uh, I'm a storyteller. Uh, in Revelation, the Bible says they, it was the saints of God, they overcame him, talking about the devil at that point, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word, the words of their testimony. Your testimony sometimes is a really good story of what the Lord did for you. Your testimony can be the testimony of what God did for somebody in the, in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Your testimony can be just something that God placed on your heart to share that meant a lot to you. But it, a lot of times it's a story that goes with it. And a testimony is a story. And they overcame him. Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of their testimony. So I have some little stories to tell you. I, I, uh, I, I'm a storyteller, and sometimes my wife gets weary of my stories because she's heard them. She's heard them all, most of them, at least once, and some of them a couple times. And every now and then she'll say, you already told me this story. And I'll say, well, um, the story's worth telling. It's worth telling again. And I said, furthermore, you don't just read your Bible one time and, and that's it for your lifetime. You, you, you keep reading it. And the, every time you read it, uh, the, more, uh, the more it's going to mean. You'll get more meaning out of it. 
And before I read this scripture, I just want to say again, I'm working out of this book, Gazing into Glory uh, by Bruce Allen. I want you to get this book. I say it every time. I want you to get this book because there are times I'm going to be reading right from the book. There's going to be times I'm talking just like I am now. But I'm. Uh, he says it better than I could ever say it. So I'm just going to read some of this stuff to you. And sometimes it brings me to tears. I've read this book. I don't know how many times now. There's portions of it that I've read three, four, five times probably. And every time I read it, uh, the, Bible, the Bible does the same thing to me. Every time I read it, I get more insight. I get more meaning out of it when I read it more than once. I'm going to say this once here today, but if you want to see it again and again and again, just get it to sink down in your heart. Get the book, Gazing into Glory by Bruce Allen, and uh, you can read as many times you want. And I underline stuff. I put an asterisk beside it. Sometimes I'll highlight it. Uh, but this, this book, I just want to see if I can show you here. This book has all my own markings and you'll see you'll see um stuff underlined you'll see stuff underlined twice you'll see a an asterisk alongside the page alongside the page and then you'll see little marks down on the edge of my book where that asterisk the horizontal line goes out and down over the edge of the book to the cover and uh but you can do that with your own book you need the book i'm only going to uh share this with you once probably and so um uh, let's just let's do it um, let me get my scripture here. They talk about the good old days. In the good old days, you had to have your Bible in your hand if you wanted the Word of God. Now you're sitting at your desk and you just think. First uh, Corinthians chapter 5. And you press a couple buttons and it comes right up in front of you. Whatever version you want. I prefer King James. The only thing I don't prefer about King James is when they talk about Jesus or God. Jesus or the Holy Spirit, they use regular letters. They don't use capital letters in King James. And that messes me up. I don't like that. I always like to, when I talk about the Holy Spirit or Jesus, I want a, I want a capital letter. So I always have to think about that as I'm reading. It'll, it'll say in he or, or he himself. Uh, he, uh, no, that's beside the point, I guess. I want to, I want to read first Corinthians, uh, second Corinthians. Did I say first Corinthians? I, I mean, second Corinthians chapter five. And I'm going to start with verse 17. Now, all those other verses are great verses. Uh, it, and uh, 17 actually uses the first word in, the, in this verse, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The first word is therefore. When you see a therefore in the Bible, here's what's important. Therefore, uh, with all that in mind, what you just read, therefore means with all that in mind, what you just read, Here's what I'm, here's what we're getting to. And I'm going to just get to it right here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and if you aren't in Christ right now, get in, become a Christian, receive Jesus as your savior. You'll, you'll thank me when I see you in heaven. You'll say, Harold, thank you so much for encouraging me to receive Jesus as my savior. Uh, you can wait to the last minute, but you don't know when the last minute is going to be. At the last minute, there have been souls who have come to Christ. I have a neighbor that was a hospice nurse, and she watched people come to Jesus at the very last minute. She'd say, what do you see? They'd be looking up in the, in the corner of the ceiling where the two walls met, and up in the corner, and they, she'd say, what do you see? She knew they saw something, and I, I just saw Jesus, and I never such, saw such love. And this man, one particular man, she wrote, she, I have her book. One particular man said, I see Jesus, I never saw such love, and I never saw such disappointment. He was the rankest sinner of all sinners. He sinned every sin you could possibly sin, and maybe ten times badder than any other person that, that did the same sin. He was bad, and he knew it, but he saw Jesus right before he died, and she, he told my neighbor, uh, Kelly, and uh, Kelly said, what do you see? And he, I saw these eyes of love, but he said, at the same time, I saw in his eyes, such disappointment that I've never seen before. And at the same time, I saw his precious love. And he, he received Jesus, his Savior, right before he passed on. And he went straight on up to heaven. He graduated. He didn't, I had to go to school 12 years before I could graduate. He gave his heart to Jesus. And a few minutes later, he graduated. He went shooting straight on up to heaven to the streets of gold. And uh, he could watch cattle on a thousand hills. He, God owns all this. And I, go, I had a little go around with God one day, 
And he said, don't charge them for what we were going to do. And, and I said, well, who's going to pay for all this? He said, Harold, you just do what I tell you to do and I'll take care of the finances. And I'm standing there in shock because I didn't think we were going to do it that way. And I said, okay. But I said, okay. I said, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. You pave your streets with gold. We're still paving our streets with blacktop down here. And I have a hill out here and there's cattle on that hill, but I don't have cattle on a thousand hills. I think you could maybe afford to do that for us to take care of the finances. And we went on with the project. So here we go. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I hope by right now, if you just gave your heart to the Lord, I'm talking about you. He is a new creature. She is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Old things. All the ugly, mean, nasty, greedy, lustful thoughts you've ever had are passed away. And behold, I like this word, next word. It's a three-letter word. Behold, all things are become new. You know that if you just receive Jesus right now, you're, you're brand new. You even have the, this will jerk you around a little bit. You even have the DNA of Jesus. He walked this earth for 33 years, never had a day that he was sick in his life, never had any disease, and all things have become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Write that down. If you don't understand what that word is, write it down. Most of us do, some of us don't. So reconciliation. R-E-C-O-N-C-I-L-I-A-T-I-O-N. Write it down. Look it up. See what it means. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing to their trespasses, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, gazing into glory, get the book. Just get it. Quit, quit procrastinating. I don't like people that procrastinate. And sometimes I don't like me because I procrastinate. <laughs> I need to do something. I, the other day I procrastinated. I had a flat tire on my uh, New Holland tractor and it, it went flat. And I, I I called them. They said they'd come out, but please give us a call and give us a tire size. You know, sometimes they need to put a tube in the tire or whatever. And they want to just know the size of the tire before they come out. I procrastinated just a little bit. Uh, they said it probably won't make it today, maybe tomorrow. And so I procrastinated. Next thing you know, they pulled in. And I forgot, had forgotten to call them. But they knew. Uh, I guess they knew my tractor somewhat. I told them the size and of the, the tractor size of New Holland, small New Holland tractor, and they brought a tube and they needed a tube. And so don't procrastinate. Go ahead and receive Jesus, your Savior. Get this book, whatever you do. I don't care if it costs $100. It isn't $100, but if it did, it would be well worth it. It would be worth $1,000. It's one of my favorites. It's in my top 10 books. I have hundreds of books, hundreds and hundreds of books. And this is probably close to the top it's either number one or number two coming down the list i, I have so many books that are so good this is one that has really uh i like to say jerked me around it opened up my eyes there's things i've been reading in the bible and i was reading them wrong because i didn't dig into it he, this guy digs into the, if there's a word there that he has questions about he'll look it up in the hebrew he'll look it up in the greek and he'll get the actual meaning of that word so that we can understand what god is trying to tell us so here we go. Um, excuse me. Tired of saying, ah, uh, wasting my time. <laughs> Everybody has little words that they say. I have, a, we have a dear friend and she'll be talking to you and she'll say something. And then she'll say, do you know what I mean? And she says that probably every other or every third sentence, she'll say that. And uh, it's like, you don't have to say that. It's wasting time. <laughs> So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here we go. The living body of Christ. Is what we're going to be talking about. Chapter six in the book. Gazing into Glory by Bruce Allen. I had a certain prayer for years. This is Bruce talking. I would pray, Lord, I just want to be like Jesus. All of you and none of me. We're talking today. Our subject is ha, all of him, none of me. That's what our subject is. You're going to hear this a few times today. And so just wanted to 
remind you. For years, that was my the passionate cry of my heart. For all of you, none of me. And it still is. For years, oh, I'm sorry, next line down. One day, I have to keep my finger there because I ain't 16 anymore, but I'm getting better. I'll soon, I'm going backwards in time and life and aging. I'm not old. I'm maybe older than I was earlier, but I'm, I'm not, uh, I have the mind of Christ and uh, I'm believing that I have the body of Christ uh, in that by his stripes, by his stripes, he were healed. I believe that I'm healed. If I feel a little sniffle coming on, I'm like my friend uh, who wrote a book, The Tongue of Creative Force, Charles Caps. He feels a little sniffle, sniffle, whatever you want to call it. My mom comes to me in Dutch. I probably have some things I would mispronounce in your eyes. Uh, but a little sniffle, I'm ready to say it right away. Lord, I'm grateful that by your stripes I am healed. Guess what the devil does when you quote scripture? He doesn't like it. He runs. The Bible says in James 4, 7, submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A four-year-old could understand that. Think about it. When you're a Christian, I hope you're saved right now. You're, there's no reason if you not be saved right now. You could have given your heart to the Lord. It only takes a couple minutes. Do it and be done with it. And then go on with the rest. Find yourself a good church. Find somebody that you can uh, go to and, and get help. I don't know who you are, where you are. You could be here in the United States. You could be in North Africa, South Africa, uh, Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan. I've been there. All these places that uh, that you can go to and Jesus is there and he wants to be your savior and your Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm getting off track. I'm getting off on a tangent. I want to get right back in here. So one day he says, I was ministering in Libby, Libby, Montana. I've never been there. I was ministering Libby, Montana. I was graciously invited to stay with a couple who have since become dear friends. The lady of the house is profoundly prophetic with a gift that is unusual. When the Lord speaks to her, it has always been in full color, 3D movies, in quotes, as she calls them. The first night I met them, I was staying in their house, but I really didn't know them. During the meeting that first night, I had a word of prophecy for her. As I was ministering to her, the Lord spoke to my heart and showed me she would have a prophetic word for me in the morning. Of course, she wondered what was so amusing, so I had to tell her what the Lord had spoken to my heart. Next morning, they get up, and she said, grab your coffee and come sit down. I was a bit surprised, having forgotten what the Lord had said to, to me the night before, so I grabbed a coffee and sat down to visit with her. As I got comfortable, she started sharing with me what the Lord had been showing her the night that the night about during the night about my life. I'll get it right. One of the words or visions she had had was she saw myself and Jesus walking side by side along life's journey when all of a sudden I disappeared into the body of Jesus. He listen to this very carefully. This will jerk you around a little bit when you get when I get down here. Uh, another paragraph. Uh, she saw him disappear into the body of Jesus. He continued for a short distance and then he turned around and smiled at her. She said it was Jesus' face she was seeing, but he had my eyes, Bruce is saying. He then turned and continued along the road. And this is all her part of her vision, this movie she was seeing. But this time she said when he smiled at her, oh, I'm sorry. I missed a sentence. After a short time, as he continued along the road, after a short time, uh, he once again turned around and smiled. But this time, she said, when he smiled at her, there was no longer any trace of me. It was his eyes looking back at her now. Now here, in other words, here it is. It was all of him and none of me. When people look at you, they need to see Jesus. They need to see the glory. The glory is God, in one word, is the glory. And it's all the great things that he has for you, all the, the, all the wonderful, wonderful things. I'm not going to start because I could go on for a long time talking about the glory of God, and maybe we'll have a chance to just talk about the glory. I wrote a whole bunch of notes down this morning about the glory, 
and I'm pretty excited about it. And I'm going to share it with you, but not today. I'm going to get through this today, and who knows where we'll go next time. Uh, all of him, none of me. Does that make any sense, she asked. I shared with her how every night as I lay my head on my pillow, one of the prayers I would pray before I drifted off to sleep would be, all of you and none of me, Lord. I just want to be like Jesus. That should be all of us, our prayers. Not just somebody that writes a book. Not just somebody that's your preacher, your pastor, your bishop. That means all of us. If you are a Christian, you want to be just like Jesus. Okay. I was excited and blessed as the Lord revealed through her prophetic word that he had heard my prayers and was at work even then to bring the desire of my heart to pass. He'd been praying this for years. And now she comes out with a prophetic word that that's what's going to happen. All of him and none of Bruce. Okay. Now I had a picture, a point of focus for my sanctified imagination. We talk about our imagination our, we, as we think, so are we. As a man thinketh, so is he. And as a woman thinketh, so is she. How do you like that? As for all of us, the Bible was written in the male, whatever, and it's understood that the females are included. Um, her prophetic word, word that he had heard my prayers and was at work even then to bring the desire of my heart to pass you know god will give you the desires of your heart psalm 37 delight thyself in the lord and he will give you the desires of your heart guess what when you delight in the lord you some people worry about oh what if i desired something i shouldn't desire it says as you delight yourself in the lord when you're delighting in the lord there's nothing sinful in your heart at that point when you delight in him. So don't worry about that part, but he will give you the desires of your heart in the case where you delight yourself in the Lord. Okay, now, I had a picture, a point of focus for my sanctified imagination. I would see what my friend had described every time, every time I would set my heart and sanctified imagination upon the Lord. Yeah, this next part is called All of Him, None of Me. My wife and I were ministering in Belfast northern ireland a few years ago and it happened to be on rosh hashanah i guess i pronounced that right the jewish new year which usually excuse me i got a tickle which usually falls in september or october for the first nine or more years rosh hashanah has been a season of profound clarity in the supernatural for me because i've had visitations from god every year during that time i've had it i've had <clears throat> other visitations and visions throughout the year but when he visits me on the jewish <coughs> excuse me new year uh or he has been speaking to me about what he is releasing to the body of christ in this season now listen that night in worship i saw a 12-foot angel standing on the platform blowing a long golden trumpet i wondered what was going to happen so i asked the lord what are you saying he said it's rush Hashana, you know, Jesus was Jewish. So this all ties together. The moment he said that immediately above the platform, the heavens opened and the glory of God shone with such brilliance. I literally had to turn my face away. I knew I could not look into his glory without damage being done to my natural eyes. However, as I turned, I saw the figure of Jesus standing in the throne room of heaven. And he said, come on up. <laughs> wasn't, that, wasn't that just... Uh, Jerk you around. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. At some point, I was finally able to stand up, and I missed a little part. He says, "Come on up here." Instantly, every atom in my body began to resonate as I were vibrating, as if I were vibrating at an unimaginable frequency, and I was gripped with a great excitement and awe. I immediately found myself prostrate before the throne of God in adoration and worship. At some point, I was finally able to stand up and take in my surroundings. Now, you have to understand the throne of God and the sea of glass before the throne of God are vast beyond mortal comprehension. As far as the eye could see, and it can see very far in that realm, in every direction was this vastness before his throne that was made of a substance resembling glass in its texture and transparency. His throne, how can I describe his throne? It was made up of what looked to be a solid substance, and at the same time, it resembled a cloud of glory. 
It was both tangible and ethereal. I hope I said that right. I, there's a lot of big words I try, and if, you, if you're used to using them every day, uh, um, it might not sound right. It might sound a little bit funny. Uh, E-T-H-E-R-E-A-L, ethereal. This may sound strange, but it was worshiping and singing forth the praises of God. Everything in that realm resounds at some level with the praises of him who sits on the throne. This part, I have a few words to say about this. It just tickles me. Uh, sometimes as I'm reading this book, I'll read this stuff, or I'm listening to him on YouTube or something, and I'll hear him say something, I just have to cry. I've, I've turned into a big ball baby in my older age. I'm 72, by the way. I'm 72 years young. I'm not old yet, just older. To say that everything was light does not do justice for what I experienced. The best way to describe it is there was an absence of all darkness. No shadow or shading that would indicate darkness. There is no heaviness brought about by the cares of life as we know them here on earth. It was the most compelling and desirable place anyone could ever want to be. And yet I know the Lord in his graciousness protected me from the fullness of the light, life and glory that are to be experienced there because I would not have been able to withstand such holiness, purity and power while still in his mortal body. I stood up, and for some reason, there was only about 400 people standing before his throne with me. They were made up of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and represented the whole of mankind. I looked toward the Father on the throne and realized I was not able to see his countenance. Rather, he was shrouded in a cloud of glory, which I knew was for our protection. As I stood there in awe toward, toward his throne, he lifted his right arm and extended toward the group a scepter. Out from his presence, there's... There, this is the only way I can describe the communication I experienced. His voice said, I will grant your request even up to the half of your kingdom. This gets really interesting. Uh, when, I, when I read about this, uh, when you read about heaven, I've heard people make this comment. If, pe if we only knew how good heaven's going to be, there would probably be somebody just jumping out in front of dump, dump trucks, jumping off of bridges just to get to heaven. I don't think that's a good way to go to heaven, but that was, they were just exaggerating the idea, the fact that heaven is such a wonderful place and there's no way to describe it unless you go there and you see it for yourself, then you still can't describe it. I still see my mother coming down one morning. I told you a story before. It's worth telling again. She came down one morning, getting ready to eat breakfast, and she was all... I guess, beside herself. She didn't know what to say, what to do. Uh, she's stuttering around and trying to talk, and she couldn't talk. She couldn't find words to describe what she wanted to tell us. That night, they woke up, and the angels were singing outside their bedroom window, and I don't know how many it was. It might have been 10. It might have been a million angels just singing. She said it was the most beautiful singing she'd ever heard in all of her life. But the angels came to their window that night and sang. We believed in angels at our house. My mother would tuck us kids in and she, and part of her prayer was, and Lord, thank you for the angels that are watching over little Harold. And, and she sleeps tonight or my little sister Faye, a lot of times she'll pray with both of us together. And thank you for the angels that are watching them as they play tomorrow. Thank you that they're watching over them. And God doesn't even want us to stump our toe on a stone. The angels hold us up with their hands, it says in, the, in Psalm uh, 91. And uh, he doesn't want us to get hurt. He wants to take care of us. He thinks of us as his children, just like you, daddy and mommy. Think about your kids. You don't want them to get hurt. You don't want anything bad to happen to them. You want the best for them. And that's what God has for us, the best. Now, here we go. Here's what happened. He said, I'll grant you your request, even up to half the kingdom. Now, here's, listen to this. <laughs> I have to laugh. It makes me cry sometimes. I have to explain to you that over the course of my life, I have had many unanswered questions. I've lifted up before the Lord. That evening, I had a number of requests to present before the throne of grace, seeking for the Lord for insight, wisdom, and direction. When I found, my, when I found myself in the throne room of heaven and the Father indicating that he was going to grant my request even up to half of the kingdom, something extraordinary took place. God knew when he was, what he was, who he was talking to when he told Bruce that, okay? He might not have told me that, <laughs> but at the same time, we'll get on to, through this and you'll figure out how you qualify too, okay? Uh, 
everything I thought was important to me, every petition and request disappeared. It was all gone. When the Lord extended that scepter and promise, the only response coming out of my inner man was, all of you, none of me. I just want to be like Jesus. Here he is. He's being offered half of the kingdom, and all he wants is all of you, none of me, he told the Lord. And he said, I just want to be like Jesus. There was no hesitation, nor was there any consideration about my list of questions and petitions. Kind of like, who was it? Solomon. He could have had anything he wanted, and he asked for wisdom. How wise is that? Three times the Lord extended his scepter, and three times without a moment's hesitation, my answer was, all of you and none of me. I just want to be like Jesus. After that third time, I instantly became aware of my surroundings once again in the worship service there in Belfast. At that moment, it dawned on me. I could have had any number of the desires of my heart fulfilled in response to the Lord's generosity, and not one of those important requests even came to mind. I read that. I wrote the date, and I wrote, wow, exclamation mark. I do stuff like that when I'm reading a book. If there's a, a white space, I like to write something. In there. I'll, I'll, write, I'll write in the hallelujah, maybe, amen, and then I'll put four exclamation marks and then a big exclamation mark. Those four exclamation marks mean, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, how many did I say? Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm missing some. It's five exclamation marks. I'll get to that. I glean... <laughs> I gleaned spiritual weaponry. This is important. I gleaned a number of insights from that experience. I learned in this dis dispensation of time, the Lord is bringing forth a generation whose sole passion will be to emulate and be like Jesus, who was the mature son of God. We will see a generation come forth in maturity in this hour. I realize when we deem significant and important, oftentimes, and I realize what we deem, what we deem significant and important, oftentimes is not what the father is passionate about. We must learn to discern what he desires, what his desires are for our lives and follow them. If we will learn to be led of the spirit, we will see the fulfillment of his purposes in our lives and in this earth. There's nothing wrong in having petitions and questions and seeking him for answers. We must, however, be willing to set aside our wants and desires for his we want his desires. We want to be like Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. Uh, we have all these wonderful things that Christ gives us when we receive him as our Savior. I understand that the expression, all of you and none of me, had to do with my character. That's what he understood. We will retain our personality because it is what makes us uniquely us. But we will lose our individuality. That's a big word for me, individuality. I know what it means. Uh, it's a big word. We will become like Christ. We will walk in the kingdom authority. We will interact with the realm of the spirit, and we will become everything God says we are. As I was meditating on what had just transpired, still in the posture of worship, with my hands lifted in worship, I suddenly felt a burning on my right ring finger. I opened my eyes and looked at my right hand, and I saw that God had put a signet ring on my finger. I must reiterate, what I was experiencing was what the Lord was speaking and releasing to the body of Christ as a whole, not to me individually. The signet ring speaks of authority. It speaks of a coming of age in the family to which you belong. It indicates from that point on, the moment you now have, from that point on, the moment you now have the pr privilege of wearing that ring whatever you say and do has the backing of the house to which that ring belongs it speaks of maturity we are moving from a give me mentality to a make me mentality how you like that we are moving you and me we're all doing this this is what we should be doing we should, we should be moving from a give me mentality to a make me mentality um, delight thyself also in the lord he'll give you desires of your heart and your heart's desire needs to be Make me, Lord. Make me who you want me to be. We are, uh, make me what? Not a give me mentality, but a make me mentality. Make me what? Make me like Jesus, who's the firstborn among many brethren. And Romans 6, 13. Write this down, Romans 6, 13. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness 
to sin. But present yourself to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Romans 6.13. There's a lot in there. Look it up and read it. Read it four or five times, and by the tenth time, you might start getting it. I heard a speaker one day say, uh, "Back, this was back in the day when we had cassette tapes. I just dated myself, but that's okay. It was a part of the good old days. We had cassette tapes. And this speaker said you need to listen to this tape ten times at least. He said they've done studies, scientists have done studies, and they tell me that when you hear something, you need to hear it ten times before you really get 100% of what's being said. You probably are familiar with that with your kids. You have to tell them ten times sometimes before it soaks in. That, I didn't know I was going to say that one second before I said it, but it just came to me as I was re- saying this. Uh, we need to hear the word of God more than once. We need to read it and read it and read it. And I, I, I just got to tell you this. I remember, uh, it's probably been five years ago, maybe I was reading the scripture and it said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not into thine own understanding. And the word own jumped out at me. It just almost, it smacked me right between the eyes and lean not into thine own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. And it hit me. I, I that word just jumped out. Don't worry about your own understanding. You, you can't understand everything. You can't be an expert in every field. And so you don't understand everything. And But the Lord said to me, there, you have brothers and sisters that have been around longer than you, or maybe not as long as you, but they have wisdom. They have knowledge that you don't have, and they can help you understand. Don't lean into your own understanding. There are people around you who can help you. And then uh, recently, I'm going to say in the last six months, that was probably in the last five years that stood out. I was doing the saying, I was just saying the same verse because by now I, I knew it by heart and it jumped out at me. I was reading about the things of the spirit. Don't lean unto your own understanding. I'm here to help you. The Lord was saying to me, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And many times when you need to make a decision, that first thought that comes to your mind, the first thing into your brain is usually the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Okay. Should I go left? Should I go right? And, Immediately in your spirit, you'll hear right or you'll hear left and you just go what you hear. You start hearing the voice of the Lord. We need to hear the voice of the Lord. We have spiritual ears to hear. We have spiritual eyes to see. Just like we have five senses in the natural, we have five senses in the spirit world. And that's this is what we're talking about today. Uh, I just read Romans 6, 13. To be literal, your members, your senses should be yielded to God as weapons of righteousness. Weapons of righteousness. Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, we must choose to yield our spiritual abilities, gifts, and senses unto God. Part of that yielding is our sanctified imagination. That's a loaded two words, sanctified imagination. So daily when you get up, go to Romans 6, 13 and pray. Lord, I sanctify my eyes. I present them unto you as an instrument of righteousness. I sanctify my hearing. I sanctify my tongue. I sanctify my smell, my touch, my imagination, and my logical reasoning mind. Father, today I yield them to you as, an, as instruments of righteousness. I like Psalm 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. And I, I, I thank the Lord for peace. I do have peace. I can go through some really tough stuff. I, even in a thunderstorm at night, many times, back when I was milk, a dairyman, I was milking cows, I'd be so tired I'd go to bed. The nastiest thunderstorm, lightning and thunder and noise and shaking the house, and I'd just go right on sleeping. Well, my wife would wake, wake right up, but she'd get more sleep than I did. And I was just out. I was out. Uh, so... He'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. How, when you, Bruce Allen digs into this stuff and uh, whose mind is stayed on thee. We need to keep our minds stayed on Jesus throughout the day as you work, as you, as your little kids and you play, keep your mind stayed on Jesus. Have Christ-like thoughts. Have good thoughts. What's, finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are a good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Keep your mind on Jesus, on the good stuff, on, the, on his word. 
keep your mind on love and joy and peace, the fruits of the spirit, all of them. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith against such there's no law. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It's good stuff. So if you do that, if you, if you trust, uh, if you keep your mind on Jesus, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Speaking to God, this is Isaiah, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust in Jesus. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. Keep your mind on him. Think about the good stuff. 95% of the American people think negatively. 95% of church members think church, people that go to church, I'll just put it that way, think negatively. The whole world basically thinks negative thoughts most of the time. Christians will get up in the morning and uh, all my knee hurt me all night. It just hurts today. It's just a mess. Don't say that. That's what the devil wants you to believe. It might hurt. Truly hurt. Physically, pain, physical pain. Don't confess it. The devil wants you to confess it so he can get on in there and dig a little deeper, make it hurt a little more. Just like Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the storm came up. The boat was rocking. That's what Jesus was doing. Just like Harold Wilderson they wasn't getting enough sleep. And I don't think Jesus got much sleep. They were always on him, wanting to hear more, wanting, wanting him to touch them and heal them and do whatever. They were on him. He didn't get a whole lot of sleep. That's my personal thoughts. That's just, and that's not just me embellishing the story. As I see it in my mind's eye, I can see him just running day and night trying to uh, keep up with the crowds or, or stay ahead of the crowds, go to the mountain and pray or whatever. Uh, but when that storm came up, the disciples immediately went to Jesus and shook him and woke him up. And the boat was rocking back and forth. And whoever it was, Peter or whoever, stood there holding on to something, onto the mast of the sail, and said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? We're going to perish. We're going to perish. Don't you give a hoot? And he was fired up. And Jesus looked at him and said, uh, uh, I'm not sure it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, or where it was, but he, the one uh, verse in one of the uh, books, those three books, says, he said, where is your faith? Who told you? And if it had been me, I'd have said, who told you that? Who told you that we're going to perish? Well, guess who? Who comes to steal, kill, and destroy? And that's exactly what Satan was trying to do to the whole boatload. He wanted to destroy the whole works, get rid of them. Hope they go sink to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. I stood on the banks of the Sea of Galilee one day and I looked across. I think it's like six or eight miles and you can see right straight over the other side on a nice clear day. And it was, they were right there in the middle of the sea and they say some of the worst storms on the Sea of Galilee are so bad. That, uh, and I've been in a storm like that up in Canada and somebody came along in a motorboat and rescued us. We were in a canoe and we prayed, Lord, help us. We need help. And you, when you cry out to God, God hears your prayer and in, in, in this Crossing the desert, the Israelites, they'd get in trouble. They, they knew they'd done messed up big time. And they'd cry out to God. And, and the Bible says, and God heard their prayer and answered their prayer. We need to cry out to God. I've done that sometimes in my life. And the Lord has been very, very good at answering my prayers when I cry out to him. We're, you're serious when you cry. Okay. Oh, I lost my place. Here we go. Because... We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We, we must choose to yield our spiritual abilities, gifts, and senses unto God. To be, I just read this. We, we need to yield our instruments to God. And because we don't, uh, we get in trouble. And so we need to pray, Lord, sanctify my eyes and my, all these things that we just talked about. I need to sanctify my imagination and all these things. And then we talked about the fact that he'll keep you in perfect peace because your mind is stayed on him. So think about him throughout the day and as you sleep at night. Uh, and it's a, and we, I want to go to a little explanation about this, uh, this word uh, mind, who, who, uh, whose mind is stayed on thee. I want to say this, and this is right from the book. That word mind in the Hebrew is a fascinating word. I was telling you that Bruce, when he doesn't totally realize, when he's not totally sure that he understands what the word of God is saying, he'll take the, he'll take that verse apart and take one word at a time. And uh, maybe not all the these and the thous and the ands and stuff like that, but words that 
look pretty important, but you're not quite sure. He looked this word up, the word mind. And in that original word that was there in that verse, whose mind is stayed on thee, that original word, Greek word, was yet, sir. Y-E-T-S-E-R. And it means that which is formed in the imagination. Many times you sin because your thoughts are bad. And it's, it can actually be literal sin. Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman and lusts after her, he, he done committed adultery in his mind. It becomes real. It's a, you got to really be careful what you think. We need to confess that we have the mind of Christ. And I confess it. I probably confess that every day. I don't know how many times a day. And uh, just know that you're a new creature. All things are passed away. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Your mind, your body, your uh, spirit, everything becomes new. And I, I really been digging into this lately and it's really making sense. Jesus walked the face of the earth. I said this for 33 years, I guess it was never had a pain or a belly ache or sickness or disease. All those, all that time because, because of his stripes on the cross. That's one of the reasons why we can walk uh, with beautiful bodies, bodies that aren't fat, I'm starting to get some of this. It took me 72 years, but I'm starting to find some bodies that don't have aches and pains, arthritis and cancer and everything, every disease known to man. They ask the medical profession. They'll tell you all about all the diseases. And it seems to me they keep making up new diseases so they can sell more drugs. Pharmaceuticals are raking in billions and billions of dollars over this disease, that disease, and the other disease. And they keep having to come up with new names for all these medications. And some of them are really ridiculous, some of the names. And then on the TV, if you hear that ad, they'll say, ask your doctor. <laughs> if you shouldn't take this, whatever the crazy name is of this medicine, for whatever ails you, and um, see if uh, your ears don't fall off. They have all these things that could happen to you if you take them. You could get a belly ache, get a headache, you could have migraine headaches from taking this drug. and and ask your doctor. They want to pass it off on to the doctor so they don't get in trouble because it was your doctor's idea to give it to you. Oh, that's beside the point. That has nothing to do with what. Well, it does have something to do. Whose mind has stayed on you. Keep your mind on Jesus. Here it is. The word yet, sir. And it means that which is formed in the imagination. Paraphrasing Isaiah 26. Oh my, I'm already, we're out of time. Paraphrasing Isaiah 26, 3, we would read, you will keep him in perfect peace whose imagination imagination properly forms images of you that reflects trust in you. This, there's a clear connection between heart purity and spiritual sensitivity in the spirit scriptures. We know the warfare that we wage is not based on carnal weapons because we don't have a carnal enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I'm going to read this. I'm going to stop. Uh, Second Corinthians 10, four to five, write it down. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Second Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, King James Version. Wow. I thought we were going to get further than that today, but I interrupted myself too many times. <laughs> I hope you just know that I love you dearly and I want the very best for you just as if you were my children, just as God sees you as a daddy, your daddy sees you. He wants the best for you. Your mommy wants the best for you. Uh, your husband, your wife, they want the best for you. And uh, I just want you to know that I want the best for you and I love you dearly. Each one of you, you're my brothers and sisters. I hope there's nobody that's listening right now that isn't saved. I gave you an invitation to come to Jesus. Just do it. Even if you haven't done it now, do it right away as soon as I stop. And uh, Lord, I pray uh, the glory over everyone that's listening. Uh, I pray it over them and under them and around them and in them and through them. Lord, let your glory just shine forth off their faces as they go about their daily activities. And help us to be, help us to, Go you where you want us to go. Help us to do what you want us to do. Help us to say what you want us to say. Help us to think how you want us to think. And help us to be everything you want us to be, dear Lord. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.